Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. Hey everyone, before we jump into the podcast, make sure you smash that like button. If you are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button as well. I really appreciate it. And lastly, every Wednesday I do a hump day giveaway over on my Twitter page, at Broads81. There is a pinned tweet at the top of my profile that explains the giveaway. It's so damn simple. This week we are giving away a Devontae Smith Eagles jersey. It's a no-brainer to enter to win. And stay tuned because every Wednesday there's something new that you will want to win. All right? There it is. Now, enjoy the show. What is going on, everyone? This is exactly what I was afraid of. The Braves beat the Phillies 6-1. to one. It was an ass-kicking, and it wasn't even close. The Phillies allowed that emotional loss in Game 2 of this three-game series to take away the momentum that they had, and they looked terrible out there on the baseball field. I had two questions entering the night. Question one, would Aaron Nola stop the bleeding? Would Aaron Nola put the team on his back and make sure that he puts this squad in a chance to win? Will he dominate that Braves lineup and put away all the concerns that we had after such a disgraceful loss in 12 innings on Saturday night? Did not love the result to that question. Question two. Did Vince Velasquez truly wake up Freddie Freeman? Was that the turning point in their lethal player turning the page and becoming the dynamic force that we know Freddie Freeman can be? Acuna is a star. We know that. Young player, flashy. Ozzy Albi, same thing. Young player, flashy. Freddie Freeman's the true pro. Freddie Freeman has not been able to be the Freddie Freeman that we have seen for how many years now in Major League Baseball? When he gets going, the team gets going. When Freddie Freeman is the dog, the team wakes up and they respect the dog. And I was so scared that allowing Freddie Freeman to see a ball get crushed off Vince Velasquez, that that would change the entire view and change the entire confidence of Freddie Freeman at the plate. And I hated the result to that question as well. Both of my questions came back negative for the Phillies, and that hurts my soul. I am sad. I really am. Now you're 18 and 17. Aaron Nola was brutal. That was such a terrible performance. I don't know. I didn't know what the hell he was doing. Look, the Phillies took a one to nothing lead. Something we are accustomed to seeing at this point is Andrew McCutcheon hitting off leadoff bombs. I mean, it's crazy. He steps up to the dish. He murders the ball. The Phillies are up one nothing. Now, they had an opportunity to tack on more runs in that first, and they didn't. JT Realmuto gets hit by Yanoa. And I wonder, is it because of what happened to Ronald Acuna Jr. last game? Sam Coonrod comes in. As Ronald Acuna is trying to swing the bat, his hands get hit. He ends up leaving the game. It looked like he was in severe pain. The x-rays came back negative, and obviously it wasn't that bad because he ended up playing this game the following night, so he returned to the lineup. The way that JT was hit, though, on the left ass cheek, two outs, first inning, maybe it was just some sort of statement of, we know what you did, we're hitting you back. It would be a disservice to us if we didn't just pluck you and move on with the game. This is us just recognizing what you did. We need to counter, and from here, we move on. Sort of like what Hector Neris did a few games back, more than a few games back now at this point. But when Nolan Arenado was at the plate the same series that Bryce Harper got hit, it was the ninth inning. He just hit Nolan Arenado. You chip your cap because you recognize what it is. It's the unwritten rules of baseball, and then you move on. Here's the thing, though. JT ended up getting the second bad throw from the catcher to try and get him stealing. He ends up going to third base. Alec Bo Boom, not able to execute the knock in the run. So it could have been 2-0 early. And would that have changed? I don't know. Here's what I do know, though. I don't know if that would have changed the outcome of the game is what I was trying to say. But here's what I do know. Aaron Nola getting placed on the mound in the first inning with a lead, whether it was 1-0 or 2-0. How can you pitch that poorly when you have the lead? I mean, how can you pitch that poorly in general? But the fact that your team gives you some comfortableness when you're stepping onto the rubber and you still are that trash. I love Aaron Nola. I'm a huge Aaron Nola fan. But that was unacceptable. Today's performance really pissed me off and ticked me off as a Phillies fan. Aaron, 
You're our guy. You are supposed to be our leader. You are supposed to be our best efficient pitcher. Do you know how meaningful tonight's game was? It was very meaningful. This team sucks on the road. They're now 5-11. and And for you to sweep Milwaukee to head into Atlanta and get a series win, that's such a different feel to where we are right now, where we're sitting in our own filth. I don't want to hear it that maybe the fans in the stands played an impact on it. I, I, no! 40,000 or zero! I don't care! Pitch better! His command was not even close. That was one of my fears. I said this after the 12 inning loss game. If I need to watch Aaron Nola, and it's unfortunate for him. The team and his teammates forced him to be the guy that had to put the squad on his back. Now, he failed. His teammates put him in that position. But sometimes your teammates have to be the leader and dig your entire team out of the hole that they climbed themselves into. That was Aaron Nola's job. But I specifically mentioned, I don't want a game where he can't command the fastball, where he's trying to pitch backwards, where he's trying to be cute and rely on his off speed. He's got to be able to dial in the fastball and pitch from there out. Why is Zach Wheeler so successful? He's at the top of the league at first pitch strikes. What happens when you have first pitch strikes? You can use your entire repertoire and advantage you. You already have the advantage as a pitcher, even when it's 0-0, when the count hasn't even started yet. Advantage the pitcher. Now make it a 1, and you're already smooth sailing. The fact that I'm watching... Aaron Nola walked the first batter, made me sick. Ronald Acuna Jr., he gets the second. Freddie Freeman gets a hit. Now you're talking about an RBI. The game's already tied. Ozzie Albee smokes one. He gets a triple. Now it's 2-1. to one, And you hang an off-speed pitch right over the plate to Dansby Swanson, who crushes one. And now the game's 4-1 in a blink of an eye. It made me feel like I was going to throw up. So it's 4-1. And you start off the third inning with Andrew McCutcheon earning a walk. Taking some very close pitches. Gene Segura getting a single on Yanoa. So now it's 4-1, right? And this team has established that they can score runs early. So I just watched the Braves go down 3-0 yesterday early in the game. And the game wasn't over. They won the baseball game. So I wasn't ruling this team out by any means. It's only the third inning. They have plenty of times, uh, plenty of opportunities to bat where they can knock in some runs and poke away at this deficit so maybe they can tie it up or whatever the case may be. But when I see Kutcher in that greasy walk, Gene Segura get another hit, who he is just sensational. By the way, he batted second. Reese Hoskins batted seventh. And more on that as we continue this conversation. Bryce Harper goes up 2-0 on account. This looks perfect. This looks like this is going to be an inning where the Phillies are going to be able to attack. Bryce Harper is now at the plate with the 2-0 count. Favor him. He swings through an off-speed pitch. And I'll give you now uh, the, be- the, not the benefit of the doubt, but but a, a, but a round of applause or a, a, just a credit. I'll give him credit. He pitched his ass off. And with the two pitches and, and to be able to be so damn effective with just two pitches for the most part and slider and fastball. I mean, he definitely was sensational and he earned himself out of that third inning, which could have been the difference maker. You got the meat of your lineup up with your leadoff batter on, your second hitter on. This is exactly how you draw it up. Get your two men on base, Bryce Harper and your and your rest of the lineup up. JT Real Muto. Who else was it? Boom. And Boom is hitting 217 right now. We could talk about going the other way all we want. We could talk about getting robbed or unlucky plays because of exit velocity and whatnot. He's hitting 217, which is not good enough. You need him way closer to that 270 to 300 number to satisfy me. And 270 to 300 in that range is what I expect out of Alec. Boom. 217 is so upsetting to see from him. And I don't think he's far, to be fair. I don't think he's far. And I do value some of his at-bats that could have 
fell with a hit or the expected batting average could have been a hit. I do value that. I don't think seeing him hit that way and seeing Andrew McCutcheon hit 160 or seeing Scott Kingery, who shouldn't even be in a Major League Baseball anymore, and I don't think he'll ever get back to that level in my personal opinion. I think he's just that lost, and he's, see ya. He's gone. Goodbye. Okay. Smell that contract later. Burn it to the ground because Scott Kingery is just a flat-out mess. You know, it's not to that level, even though he's inching his way closer under 200. You got to score a run there. And the fact that you did it and the score was 4-1 and in the bottom half of the third inning for the Braves, Freddie Freeman, because Aaron Nola misses his spot, not even close, not even relatively where JT Real Mucho was set up. He misses right where Freddie Freeman can rock another fastball. That's all on Aaron Nola. And right there, that was the gut punch. I thought last night was the gut punch. This was a secondary gut punch. The third inning. That's when I knew right then and there. Now it's 5-1. to one, They blew their chances. They really did. The Phillies had, whether it was a small chance or not, that third inning could have been, even if it's now 4-2 or if it's 4-3, and Freddie Freeman hits a home run and it's 5-3, you feel way differently about the Phillies than you do when it's 5-1. to one. And then from there, their offense basically was shit all night long. They ended up only having six hits. They struck out nine times. They were 0-8 with runners in scoring position, and they were flat-out abysmal. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You allowed this Braves team to wake up a bit. This is exactly what you did. You woke up the beast. And that was my biggest scare as you left that ballpark yesterday. Sunday night baseball. The fact that I had to grind through another brutal, brutal, stupid broadcast of A-Rod. and uh, Oh, man. It, it is just gar. Bitch, they're playing this Freddie Freeman cut when a home run's being hit. And I respect what the what the cut was all about, obviously. But I, I just I hate the broadcast, man. I despise Sunday night baseball. And the fact that I am forced to continue to watch it, it seems like the, the Phillies have been on it way too damn much to this point. Can we please stop? Please, I'm done. I'm sick of it. I'm done with this corny ass Alan Alex Rodriguez and all this nonsense. So now you're sitting at one game over 500. Well, the Mets won again, by the way. They ended up sweeping the Arizona Diamondbacks. So the Mets continue to play better, even after the whole debacle of whatever Francisco Lindor and Jeff McNeil debacle, whatever the hell that was. It's a rat. It's a possum. It's a raccoon. I mean, it's just embarrassing that that's what they came up with, as if the entire team is going to run through the clubhouse because of a rat or a raccoon or a possum. Clearly, there was some sort of dysfunction going on there, and Maybe he was calling Jeff McNeil a rat saying, oh, yeah, there was a rat there. And that's why he used that term because Jeff McNeil was that rat. I don't know. Maybe I'm speculating. I heard that earlier and I never really put it to my brain. But when I heard it, I was like, huh, maybe, maybe he was using the term in that way. I don't know. Here's what I do know, though. The Mets continue to win anyway. So regardless of if they feel good about each other, if they don't, now the Braves are starting to find themselves again Uh, The Freddie Freeman effect. It's the Freddie Freeman effect for me, which is the leader of the squad. You wake up the leader, your team is just going to have a better feel surrounding their clubhouse every day, going to the ballpark. Freddie Freeman, who who sucked, he sucked to this point. He gets you three hits. He's hitting home runs in this series. Good luck now. It seems like the Braves have a good control going, and they're going to be cruising. So now, just like we anticipated to start the season, the Mets are starting to win some baseball games. The Braves are starting to win some baseball games, and here's the Phillies. Who are you? What are you? I know what you are. You're a trash bag team on the road, and if you can't win any series on the road, especially against your division, you're going to be in some trouble. Now, you have an off day on Monday to regroup for whatever that's worth. You're going to regroup. You're going to hit the road and go play Washington. I don't feel great about it. Anything away from Citizens Bank Park, I'm having trouble trying to comprehend. No matter if they lost in ugly fashion or lost in walk-off fashion to the New York Yankees in a couple games in a row, 
that maybe that might piss them off even more. See, I would like to think to apply this logic of the Phillies are pissed because they know they let some slip and they should be in a better position. They should have won that damn series. There's no denying it. They pissed that one away. So you would think that they would be fired up to go on the road to play the Washington Nationals to try and prove a point. And oh, by the way, every time Bryce Harper walks into that stadium, you should have a fire lit under your ass because you want to step up and play for your teammate. Well, unfortunately, stepping up for your team didn't work so much in Game 3 against the Braves because Aaron Nola was a flat-out disaster. So, once again, I don't know if I can apply that logic. Maybe the Nationals on their home field would want to feel like, hey, we, uh, we're disgusted in ourselves for how it ended with New York. Let's go punch the Phillies in the mouth. And let's go spit in their face. And let's go ruin their night even more. Let's go ruin their little stretch even more. Let's kick them when they're down. All I know is this team can't play on the road. So that's why I feel so negative about any game that's not played here in South Philadelphia. And even then, I don't feel very confident. Aaron Nola stat line, four innings, five hits, five earned runs, four strikeouts, 58 pitches. Then Ranger Suarez came in. Then Matt Moore came in. There was a pinch hit for Brad Miller, or the pinch hit was for Aaron Nola. Brad Miller entered the game. I don't have a problem with pulling Nola. Would I have been okay if he stayed in? Sure. He didn't have his stuff tonight. And quite honestly, he was bad. There's no denying it. Aaron Nola was absolutely brutal. And I'm a bit devastated that that's the effort that he put out there. He knew that he needed to come up clutch. It's almost like the pressure got to him. I'll be honest with you. When I take a step back and I analyze it from an Aaron Nola perspective with some of his pitches, specifically two that really stand out to me. Well, there's a, there's more than just two, but the two that stand out the most are the obvious ones. But that pitch to Dance B. Swanson sucked. That pitch to Freddie Freeman was just dog shit. Now, there were other pitches to Freddie Freeman that were dog shit by Aaron Nola. To Ozzy Albies. All over the map. Just not in command. That was a high leverage game. And that was a high leverage situation. Coming off of what we sat through until midnight, past midnight, on Saturday night. He knew how big the stakes were. He knew how big this series win would have been. And he fell short. He collapsed. He wasn't the guy that you needed Aaron Nola to be in that moment. That doesn't mean Aaron Nola sucks forever. Let's not take this to an extreme because I already see it. Aaron Nola sucks. Why does he suck? Aaron Nola's the worst. Uh, okay. Aaron Nola is a, a, a very good pitcher in this league. He came up very short today. Both can be true. He was definitely very underwhelming tonight. That doesn't mean Aaron Nola can't put together dominant performances and make lineups as good as the Braves lineup foolish because he can. But it's clear he struggles in that ballpark and something has to change because if you didn't know, you see this team a lot and you're going to have to beat this team. So please, maybe next time we can dial in a little bit better from him. Uh, but both can be true. Both can be true. Where Aaron Nola was pathetic tonight, it doesn't mean Aaron Nola is a pathetic pitcher. I would like to think Aaron Nola's in a spot now, though, where these blow-ups and these really ugly performances don't happen this frequently because I do think it happens more frequently than most. I was thinking about this because there are nights where Garrett Cole doesn't get a win or if Max Scherzer doesn't get a win or if Jacob DeGrom doesn't get a win. And I don't put Aaron Nola on those type of categories, but I think there's a reason why I don't. Because you do see this more often than not. That doesn't mean Aaron Nola doesn't deserve to be in a Phillies uniform. It doesn't mean that he is a disgrace to the organization. Like, when you take a more broad approach to Aaron Nola, yeah, he had a stinker. He had a flat-out stinker, and I think it's unacceptable, and, and I'm bothered by it. There is this extreme part of the fan base, though, that, you know, goes through this. A's, not an A's. A's, not an A. He's one hell of a pitcher. More times than not. I would like to hope that Aaron Nola, though, can put on his big boy pants, all right, when he sees a matchup where I, I want to see that fire in his eyes. I want to see that fuck you, you piece of shit attitude in his face when he's on the mound. I didn't see that. I saw the opposite. I saw, like, what is it, courage the cowardly dog? That's what I saw out of Aaron Nola today. And it's unfortunate that he does slip those in there, but he can still be great at the same time. And he is great more times than not, but tonight... 
yeah, it's 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 damaging for me for sure, and it it makes an unsettling feeling bubble in my stomach, and, and that's where we're at. Big names are headlining this weekend's UFC 262 card. By the way, there will be no shortage of action. And DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC, has a heavyweight offer for this weekend's fight with 100 to one odds. One fighter will be take will be walking away with the belt. Will you be walking away with the cash? Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code BROADS when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 when you bet on a main card fighter to win. Place your bet and watch the fist fly this weekend. That's code BROADS to turn $1 into $100 on select main card fighters. For a limited time, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. In partnership with Metters Racetrack and Casino, see DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. So I do want to bring up a Buster Olney tweet that I saw on Buster Olney's Twitter. That would make the most sense, so I don't know why I worded it that way. And it has to do with Gene Segura. And it is pretty eye-popping, the start that he is at at this point. So if you look at, let's find it here. It looks like he retweeted a bunch of stuff during that Sunday night baseball game. He tweeted a lot during that game. Here it is. Gene Segura has not struck out in his last 32 plate appearances. Now, this is prior to the game, but he tweeted this out yeah, before the game started. Gene Segura has not struck out in his last 32 plate appearances, the longest current streak in the National League. A related note, Segura is batting 333 with two strikes in the count this season. The MLB average is 156. So he's basically doubling the MLB's average when it comes to hitting with two strikes. That's pretty damn impressive. And I just wonder how much you think of him putting the ball in play, him poking balls down the first baseline, him poking balls up the middle. Just the fact that he just puts the ball in play, how much that is correlating with those numbers that we are seeing. Now, Reese Hoskins batted seventh tonight. Gene Segura batted second. I'm all in favor of Gene Segura batting second. The guy is just on a tear right now, and he's on another level where it's very justifiable to move him way up in the lineup. While Reese Hoskins is going through one of his colder streaks, he is coming off of an extremely hot streak. I do think that someone like Reese Hoskins deserves to bet higher than seven, and I'm willing to toy around with some things because nothing is perfect with this lineup. Nothing has shown me such lethal play that I can't move anything. I'm fully aware that I'm willing to move pieces around and whatnot. By the way, Gene Segura did not strike out at all in tonight's game, so that does stay alive with the plate appearances. Reese Hoskins went one for four, and he did not strike out either in this game, but I do think that... Um, seven is a little low for my liking for Reese Hoskins. Could you maybe move him above Bohm so he bats fifth? So it's Kutch, Segura, Harper, JT, Reese Hoskins, Bohm, Didi, Oduble, Aaron Nola, or the pitching spot, I guess I should say. Maybe there's something to that. I don't know. I just think that seven is a little low for my liking for Reese Hoskins because I do know that he is absolutely, you know, incredible when he does become that dominating force. Before we get to the Anytime Hotline calls, I did host on 97.5 The Fanatic Day, and before me, Rob Motti was on, and Rob does such a fantastic job, and his question for his show was, is it time to move on from Hector Neris, and if so, who is it in place, pretty much? And Sam Coonrod was an option, Jose Alvarado was an option, Brian Kinsler was an option, I guess. What I'll do is I'll actually bring up the Twitter poll that they used so maybe we can see the results. I think they should just do it by committee. That's my option. Do it by committee because at this point, I'm not sold that Alvarado can be your full-time shutdown guy. He always is a problem. He goes through emotional rides. He's all over the place. He's very uncontrollable with that 101. Sure, at times it's beautiful and outstanding. Other times it's what you got against the Mets and his adrenaline was kicking so much that you couldn't rely on him whatsoever. Sam Coonrod, while he's had a good spark and he has been successful at times, I'm not fully sold on Sam Coonrod. I've seen Brandon Kinsler make mistakes. Uh, Hector Neris sure makes mistakes as well. I'm willing, just like I said with the batting order, I'm willing to try anything to spark the offense. I'm willing to try anything to try something new at the closer position. I think Joe Girardi said it best, though. 
you can make that mistake in the seventh inning, in the eighth inning, going to that fastball. It can happen in the previous inning. What's the difference? It's more about making the adjustment of not making that mistake more so than it is where he's actually throwing that pitch. That fastball after a splitter and a one-two count, you can make that same mistake in the seventh or the eighth inning, and the damage is still being done. It's just not happening in the ninth inning. What needs to be fixed is the mistake of even choosing that pitch, the mistake of even throwing that pitch and putting it in that location. That's problem number one. Not so much where Hector Neris is pitching. I don't really have a problem with Hector Neris being the closer, and it's not because I have this full faith in him. I just don't have a full faith in many of the other options either. I know Alvarado will give you good closes or good closing on the mound, and he'll give you some bad closing where he ends up. Is that even, that just feels wrong the way I'm saying it. Good closing, bad closing. He'll give you blown saves, and he'll get you some actual saves. Same thing with Hector Neris. He'll give you some saves. He'll give you some blown saves. I think it's the same thing with Coonrod. He'll give you some saves. He'll give you some blown saves. Same thing with Kinster. Saves, blown saves. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at here. I'm trying to find the actual the actual Twitter poll that they used for the show so I can see the results and just share it with you. Okay, here it is. So the way it was worded was this. After another blown save by Hector Neris last night, who should be the Phillies closer moving forward? 12.6% said Hector Neris. 11.9% said Brandon Kinsler. 405 said Jose Alvarado, which I just think is so irrational. Jose Alvarado is insanely up and down. An insane wild roller coaster. That might be the worst option of them all. Brogdon, Coonrod, or other wins with 35%. And I would imagine it's because of Coonrod. Not so much Brogdon or other. But 40.5% claim that Alvarado should be the closer moving forward. I, I think that that's just terrible. At the same time, why are we even having this discussion? You got to be in a position to win a baseball game, and the Phillies were not as they fell 6-1 to one in this game, and it wasn't even close, and after the third inning, it was basically just trash. You know, you got their relievers out there making web jam plays, catching the ball behind his head, turning to electric stuff, the fans going wild while I'm sitting there in, in, in filth. And maybe dropping some tears. And very sad. I was sad watching tonight's game. Sad. And it wouldn't have been that sad if they lost 6-1 to and Aaron Nola shit to bed if they would have won that game. After being up 7-4 to in the 12th inning with, who was it? De Los Santos it was. I almost said Ranger Suarez. No, Ranger Suarez came into this game. And, you know, I thought Ranger Suarez did okay. But, to be honest with you... I don't give a damn. I just don't give a damn. Ranger Suarez and the conversation of Ranger Suarez is so low on my list of things that matter to me that it's so irrelevant. I don't even care. I don't even care about what Ranger Suarez looked like. There's so many other feels right now going on in, in my body internally because of the red pinstripes that Ranger Suarez, come on, Ranger Suarez, unbelievable. All right, we're going to rock some text messages from the Anytime Hotline. Martin from Ocean City says, are, am I con- he says, are you concerned about Aaron Nola? So he asked the question if I'm concerned about Nola. I'm not concerned because I feel that at this point, you know, I'm big on growth and I'm big on players developing and whatnot. And I think Cotham has done a good job so far with this pitching staff of calming them down and being the guy that he needs to be. And it just seems like maybe they found a good pitching coach. And I'm, and I'm excited about that. You saw multiple times him calm down pitchers and him just say the right things and take good mound visits and whatnot. I like Cotham and I'm excited for what he does for some of these pitchers. Aaron Nola right now is 27 years old. All right. He's like in that prime. I feel Aaron Nola at this point is what he is. He's not going to get extremely better. He's not going to get worse. He is what he is. Aaron Nola has given us the Aaron Nola experience, and you can win a lot of baseball games with that. Am I concerned about him, Martin? Not necessarily. I think you need more with your entire pitching staff in general. I've been screaming this for years. I would love to insert someone in front of Aaron Nola so then you have somebody, Nola, Wheeler, Eflin, and then you have four very strong candidates. I like Aaron Ola. I think he's a very good pitcher. I'm not concerned about him because I, I, I truly think this is what he is, and my expectations are already set for Aaron Ola. This happens. This is Aaron Ola. Most of the times, he's going to be dialed in. 
A lot of the times he's very strong and he's very smooth. He give you he gives you these type of performances though. Splash throughout a little more than my liking, but I know it's there. So no, I'm not concerned. I think Aaron Nola can give you eight, nine, ten strikeouts in his next outing and give you seven innings. I think he can give you seven and two thirds. I wouldn't be surprised if he gives you seven and two thirds in his next outing and he's dominant. And then he follows that up with six and two thirds, and he's dominant. And then he follows that up with a very strong outing. And then he gives you a four and two thirds, and he's really ugly. I mean, that is Aaron Nola to a T. So, with that being said, Martin, no, I'm not really concerned with Nola because I think my expectations are set. Nick from South Philly. This team scores all of its runs early and then forgets how to knock players in. Every single game in all caps. This time, one run was not enough. How do you see this, Broads? How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think it's a problem, Nick. I do. I think it's a problem. This team is constantly going out there, and they're scoring their runs early, which is a huge positive. It's not easy to do that. Andrew McCutcheon is red hot. My man is stepping up to the plate and, and hitting home runs with ease. It's really crazy, the turnaround of him offensively. And I would expect to see the same things happen defensively, where he feels that confident. You can hear him while he's mic'd up, running around the bases, and I'm paraphrasing him and saying, like, I'm the best. I'm the best, right? Just hyping himself up. He needs to carry that over to the defensive side as well, and then we get the full-on Andrew McCutcheon that we need him to be. I'm, I'm proud that this team pounces on teams early and takes a lead, but it really is upsetting to see you go scoreless after that. That third inning, what are you going to do? Are you going to lay down, lie down, and just get waxed? Or are you going to fight back? Are you going to score more? You can't just score within the first three runs and then go completely quiet and think that that's a recipe for success for long term. That's going to come back to bite you. That's going to cost you. Where does it go? Are you telling me that the pitcher that you found out and you dialed into right from the jump somehow just completely annihilated you with a counterattack and you guys look that foolish? I'm sorry. I can't say that they are that lethal. They are that elite. Every single pitcher, whoever touches the mound, is that strong and that significantly smooth to make that many adjustments where you go from just destroying and annihilating them to score early runs to you look like a child in Little League. I'm sorry. It just isn't reality. There's another disconnect there, and they need to be better at the plate. So I, I am concerned on how poorly they look when they're at the plate after, let's say, the fourth inning. That has to change. If this is what you get all year long, and this is the identity of the Phillies, First three innings, they score a lot of runs, and then from there, they can't dial it in at all, and they just look pathetic. Well, then uh, I'm scared, all right? I'm scared if that's the answer, if that's who the Phillies are. Justin from Philadelphia, I had a feeling yesterday was so tough that it would continue into Sunday night baseball, and I was right. This team is so inconsistent. Starting to feel like those wins against the Brewers were based off of Milwaukee's IL problem. Oh, there's no denying that that was in play when we were breaking down that series. I also think, though, that a, a team puts that away. You could lose those games, and I wouldn't have been surprised if the Phillies lost some of those games. So the fact that they didn't, even though Milwaukee was battling a lot of injuries and Christian Yelich goes on the IL and this and that and, and everything that occurred, and you got this dominating performance out of Zach Wheeler, all of that played a role for sure. But, you know, you can still, it's hard. Four-game sweeps are hard. No matter if you're missing guys or not, if you were playing the old Baltimore Orioles that won five games a year, you could still lose that series, one game of the series, one game of the series. It's hard to sweep four-game series no matter if a team is banged up or not just because the nature of baseball. One bad pitch, two bad pitches, one really good swing, and the rest is history. You're done and you're falling and you're losing that game. So while I do think that that absolutely 1,000% had something to do with that four-game series, I still give credit to the Phillies for what they did. And, you know, I thought it was really fascinating. When Zach Wheeler had that night, I was listening to some radio host throughout the city, and uh, they were discussing Zach Wheeler. And they said, you know what, what's crazy? I can't rely on Zach Wheeler to do that every single night, so I can't feel good about that win. And that's asinine to me. No shit Zach Wheeler's not going to give you a complete game shutout every time he's on the mound. 
But what you look for is a pitcher that has the capability of doing it. So he can do it in a in a seven-game series. If someone throws that, you don't think, well, every time that guy's on the mound, he's going to give you a complete game shutout. That That's such a ridiculous statement. Of course not. Obviously, that's not going to be the case. That's not any. That should never be a takeaway after a Zach Wheeler complete game shutout. You think after a no-hitter is thrown or after a perfect game is thrown, someone goes, you know what? I'm not going to give credit to Zach Wheeler there, and I don't really take much stock into that game because I can't really expect Wade Miley to throw a uh, a, a no-hitter every time he's on the mound. No, that's not what it's about, but it's the fact that he has the ability to do it. It's the fact that he was capable of doing it in that scenario that allowed for you to be excited about. Not that you now have to expect him to do that every night. That's that's just embarrassing that that even came out of one of the radio host's mouths here in this city, to be honest with you. Come on. You can appreciate the accomplishment and not apply it to you need that out of Zach Wheeler every single game he plays or else you're not going to win many baseball games. I mean, that's crazy. Well, I can't rely on Zach Wheeler to do that every night. No shit. No shit. But the fact that he can do it and the fact that he has it in there, if he sprinkles that in in a big moment, well, I got more faith in that than I would Vince Velasquez or Chase Anderson on the damn mound. Come on. And we'll leave it here. Lawrence from South Philly. How do I feel about Alec Boehm? His batting average is definitely slipping. I think he's going to be fine. I think he's just going through your typical rookie situation where you're starting to... Well, other players are figuring you out a bit, right? There's counterattacks just from understanding how Alec Boehm approaches the plate, especially when you're talking about playing your in-division rivals. They're going to put a lot of emphasis on what you do and your tendencies and whatnot, so that's in play. Um, he, he does need to be better, but he is still squaring up the ball in situations that make me feel comfortable. I, I, I don't have like a long-term worry with Alec Boehm. It's more of a short-term worry. How long is it going to last? Not, is it going to last? How long is it going to last until he does end up getting in the groove? It's funny. It's like, I do feel like with the eye test, it's not as bad as the numbers speak. I'm just talking strictly eye test. What Alec Boehm does, going the other way, getting that RBI. Maybe it's an RBI ground out. Maybe it's an RBI sack fly. Maybe it's just a pure good hit going the other way that gets caught at the wall. I don't think it looks as bad as the numbers represent, and that's why I, I feel that it'll eventually kind of snap it, himself out of it naturally just by continuing to do what he does. But I do sense some frustration. I do see some body language things that shows that he's getting upset a bit, and he's going to have to keep his emotions in check and make sure that um, he starts making sure that uh, you know he kind of gets back on track a bit. But I don't have a worry that he's going to fail for such a wild, long period of time. Uh, I think he's a winner. I think he's a winning player and a, a a person who just studies the craft so much that he will make sure he works himself out of this. He will earn that. He will earn getting out of this funk that he's in statistically. So with that being said, woof, a six to one loss to the Atlanta Braves. Just what I realistically expected after this second game of the series. I had two questions. How would Aaron Ola respond to help out his team? And did Freddie Freeman wake up? Unfortunately, the results that we got to those questions were very poor for the Philadelphia Phillies, and we need to sit on that until they start this series in Washington. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time.